The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Now once when Jesus was praying in solitude and his disciples were with him, he asked them, who do the crowds say that I am? Well, they said in reply, well, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others, one of the ancient prophets who has arisen. And then he said to them, but you, who do you say that I am? Peter said in reply, you are the Christ of God. And then he rebuked them and he directed them not to tell this to anyone. For he said, the Son of Man must suffer greatly. He will be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes. He will be killed and on the third day be raised. Then he said to them, if anyone wishes to come after me, they must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for my sake will save it. The Gospel of the Lord. Amen. Please be seated. As with the Christ, so with us. First, the recognition, then the mission. First, the recognition. Who do the people say that I am? Oh, Peter bursts out. He sees it clearly. You are the anointed of God. I recognize you. I see in you God's very divinity. I see in you God's very love. I see in you God in the flesh. You're the Messiah. You are the anointed one. You are the Christ of God. Then, the mission. What does he do with being the Son of God? What does the Son of God do on earth? Well, he ushers in the kingdom where God really is in control. He, he confronts the power of evil, of disintegration, and he overcomes it. He overcomes sin. He overcomes death. He brings forth life. That's his job. That's the holy work that he does. But this mission of Jesus is always going to come into conflict. It's going to come in conflict with the world. For the world as we know it is broken. We've known it from the first day with Adam and Eve that it is a world that says, I can do this by myself. I don't need anybody. I am a separate entity. I am self-sufficient. It's all about me. I will take care of my own needs and I will protect myself. Thank you very much. That's the world in which we live. It's a given. If we don't believe that, all we need to do is look around and see the world in which we live. Now into this comes love. Comes perfect love. Perfect love, the love that Jesus gives, is not selfish. It is selfless. It is focused on the other. The great definition of love is, is seeking the good of the other precisely as the other. Love is forgiving. Love is forgetting. Love is nonviolent. Love is patient. St. Peter comes up, or St. Paul comes up with all this wonderful list in Corinthians of all the things that love is. But when love comes into contact with the world, there will be a conflict. They will collide. And there will be suffering. If you love, and I say this as categorically as I possibly can, if you love the way that God loves, that divine love, that outer focused love, you'll suffer. There, there's no other way. And so Jesus is, is saying to them, this is what's going to happen. Because what happens, the reason, the reason it does happen is that love always unmasks. Love is pure and it's clean and it unmasks hidden motivation. It unmasks evil. It unmasks business as usual. It asks us to change and be completely new creations, different creatures. 
It calls the very best out of us. It calls the love out of us. Now, when it comes in conflict, conflict with the world, there's going to be problems. And so Jesus is saying, here's my mission. Here's who I am. Here's my mission. The Son of Man is going to suffer. He's going to go against the grain of the status quo, of the way things are. He's going to go up against the power structure. They are not going to want their power structure upset, the apple cut overturned, and so they're going, to, they're, going to, they're going to crucify him. The priests and the scribes and the Pharisees and the powers that be, those who make their living off of the system, the system is about to be overturned, the temple is about to be cleansed, and they don't like it. So they must stop this love. And so the Son of Man is going to die. Not will he only suffer, but he will taste death. But you can't kill love. What does he do? How are we redeemed? How does redemption take place? God sends his Son into the world to be love incarnate. We in the world hate that love because it unmasks our unholiness, it unmasks our prejudice, it unmasks our bigotry, it unmasks our sin. Now what Jesus did on the cross was to bring all of that hatred out as they spat upon him and looked upon him naked on the cross. And they gave him hate. Now normally in the world, if somebody slaps you on the right cheek, you slap them on the left, you slap them on every cheek. You do everything you can to, to escalate the problem. What God does and what Jesus does from the cross, and this is where redemption takes place, is doesn't fight back. He doesn't fight back. He takes it, and he takes it, and he takes it, and then what does he do with it? He forgives it. He unmasks it. He nullifies it. He doesn't destroy death. He just simply makes it impotent. It cannot kill anymore. You can't kill love. And that's the reason he rises on the third day. He rises from the dead, and he will live forever. Where does he live? In us us. For as in Christ, so in we. As he, so we. If you wish to be my disciple, he says, you're going you're gonna to do what I did. You want to be a disciple of Christ? You want to be a follower of the Christ? Here's what you got to do. Here's your marching orders. Here's your mission. What I just did, you have to do. Pick up your cross daily and come after me. And you are going to suffer as well. But you too will be victorious. Do you know why? Because I dwell in you. St. Paul says in the letter of Galatians today, we who are born into the Christ. And when he's talking about the Christ, he's talking about the cosmic Christ. Not, not necessarily just Jesus of Nazareth. You know, Jesus died, but the Christ rose, and the Christ is in everybody, and we are the body of Christ. You are in Christ. Now, you clothe yourself with Christ. And as you clothe yourself with Christ, you now have the power that Christ had. You've got the power to heal. You've got the power to forgive. You've got the power to love. It's in you. It's like Prego spaghetti sauce. It's there. Most of the problem, though, is that we don't even know it's there, so we never even use it. We don't follow it. We get caught in the agenda of the world. But we live in the Christ. Now, if we are going to love that way, we too are going to come into conflict. There's no way that we will not suffer. If you love, you suffer. First conflict we come in with is ourself. Because there are parts of me that are unredeemed. There are parts of me that are angry. There are parts of me that are resentful. There are parts of me that are judgmental. There are parts of me that live in the, in, in the agenda of the world but says, I'm number one, I want it all for me. That's me, that's my sinfulness, and it's there. And until I am able to recognize it, name it, I will continue to act out on it. And the more I bury it, the more it pops up and the more I act on it. So I gotta begin with me. The sin in me. And as I began to do this, and by the way, that's a lifelong process. But as I began to do this, I began to see the sin in the world. 
we begin to move into the world and we will have conflict with the world. Right now, right now, we as a nation, we as a culture, and I think it's a worldwide culture that's going on right now, are going through such a conflict. Last Sunday brought it out clearly. And the externals change. This time it seems to be about guns and gods and gays. But the real question is, how are we going to define ourselves? What is our deepest and our truest identity as a nation, as a people, as the followers of the Christ? How do we deal with that pain, that sin, that conflict? How do we respond? By being in Christ. Christ overcame division. Sin is division and separation. Getting one group to go another, against another group. Getting one group to hate another group. It is divide and conquer. And the word for devil is diabolo, which means to the one who divides up. Uh, I divide, I make both halves weak, and now I conquer. I, I come and I take over. I am one of the good guys, you're one of the bad guys. So we're always divided between, between whites and blacks and rich and poor and conservative and liberal, between male and female. You know, that's, that's the oldest division in the world, between male and female. Uh, I saw a bumper sticker the other day that said, uh, if, if a man is, is walking in the woods all alone and there are no women around, is his wife still right? The vision's always there. It's always there. But not in Christ. Christ is inclusive. Christ rejects no one. And what the Christ is always trying to, us, to get us to do, the Christ in us, the Christ in the world, is to raise our consciousness to have the Christ consciousness, which means to be the awareness of Christ, to see through the eyes of Christ. In, and when you see through the eyes of Christ, you don't see any distinctions. You don't see any divisions. In, in Christ, St. Paul goes on to say in Galatians, this incredible statement. There is no Jew or Greek or slave or free or male or female. And, and today we can add or or, or straight, or gay, or Muslim, or Christian. Why? Because the Christ takes them all in. All in. And, and you know, one of the things that's, that's, that's really amazing is that, is that we are coming into Christ consciousness exponentially. I mean, in the last 50 years, we have, we have seen women and girls literally throughout the world go through possessions and chattel to the dignity of the daughters of God. Our consciousness is raised. We, we, we wouldn't even imagine. It wasn't too many years ago that women couldn't even vote. Our consciousness is raised. Our daughters can do anything they want to. And so we, we, we whether, whether it looks like right now, because there is a battle royale going on right now in the external world, it looks just terrible from the outside. But I really want to say from the inside, some wonderful things are going on. 20 years ago, 20 years ago, we were a homophobic culture. And literally, in the blink of an eye, we have gone from being that kind of a culture to a pope who says, who am I to judge? It's amazing. It's absolutely, utterly amazing. What does that say? It says that the Christ does dwell in us. We are waking up. They ask the Buddha, who are you? He says, I'm the one who's awake. Christ is utterly awake and sees all, and that includes all. And here's what we're beginning to discover. We're one. We are one with all of our brothers and sisters, atheists and Muslims and believers and non-believers and whites and blacks and poors and gays and straights. We're one. Oh, Father, this is my prayer. 
that all may be one. As you are in me and I am in you. That's my prayer. Now, when you have that kind of force field, that kind of spirit, that kind of energy, the forces of evil, darkness, the mysterium iniquitatum is going to rear its ugly head in spades. That's what we see going on right now. For reaction, there is a reaction. The reaction has been violent and fatal. The reaction has been terrible. And we stand in horror as we watch mass murder after mass murder, war after war, hatred after hatred rear their ugly heads. And we go, what do we do? How do we respond? What do we do about that? What do we do about these babies killed in Sandy Hook? Is there something we can do? Or do we just put our heads in the sand and go back to where we were before? What do we do about the young people killed in Orlando last week? How do we respond? Well, the very first response is to weep, is to mourn, is to cry. When Jesus is walking up the hill of Calvary, he's met by the women, and the women are weeping for him. He says, don't weep for me. Don't weep for me. You weep for your children. You weep for Jerusalem. You weep for the world. You weep for a world that is not yet redeemed. You weep for a world that is filled with ugliness and hatred. That doesn't have to be. And after you are done weeping, what do you do? after you're done mourning, but you've got to begin weeping. And by the way, I hope, I hope sometime last week or this week you shed some tears and spent some time dwelling on the suffering and the pain that our brothers and sisters are going through. It's called solidarity. It's called standing with. It's called being with. It's called dying. And we're going to suffer and we're going to die with them because if we don't, then we cannot do the next step. And the next step is absolutely imperative. He's on the cross. He's dying. And what are the words out of his mouth? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Today we celebrate the one-year anniversary of the Mother Emmanuel Church in Charleston. What a great name, Mother Emmanuel. God with us is Emmanuel, and the mother's got her arms around you, and what does the mother always do? Oh, Your Honor, I know he's my boy, and he's in trouble, and he's going to jail, but he's a good boy. He's a good boy, Your Honor. And in the midst of their tears and their pain and their hatred, what did they do? What does this congregation, this Baptist congregation do? They forgave. They let go. They loved. Because there is no future without forgiveness. Forgiveness is for the sake of the future. And if we're going to have a future as a people, we cannot fight fire with fire. The demagogues want us to hate. The demagogues want us to say, here's the problem, this group, that group. And you can name the groups. You can fill in the blanks. You're as smart as I am. They're lies. We have to expose them as lies. And then what do we need to do? We need to do what those who are in Christ, in Charleston did. Forgave. Let go and let God. And then, and then, and then. The words that... uh, Lynn manuel Miranda spoke last Sunday after the massacre at his acceptance speech for the Tonys will be ours as well. And here are the words. Love is love is love is love is love is love is love and cannot be killed and will never be swept away. And the Christ, the Christ will be victorious.